Good morning. My name is Peter Wooding and thank you for joining us. We're looking at a really uh, interesting session on, excuse me, I don't know whether you heard my dog, but he's decided to take over, uh, EV charging and infrastructure. So what I'll do is I'll hand over to you now, Oliver, and uh, deal with the uh, semi-situation I've got. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, everybody. Firstly, um, thank you very much, Peter, and the, the team at Automotive EV for inviting us to be to be part of this event. Um, my name is Oliver Jones. I'm Business Development Manager um, for Lumen Freedom, um, based in in Europe. So, firstly, quick introduction to um, the Lumen Group. Um, the Lumen Group is a, a family-owned company that was founded in 1989. Um, and it's head, headquartered in Melbourne, Australia. And you can see there an image of our, of our head office. We have in excess of 250 active customers, uh, including the majority of major automotive OEMs. As you can see here, I've included some of our major customers. We've got over 500 employees across eight locations around the world. So we truly are a, a global company. And we are a, a tier one, tier two, uh, manufacturer and supplier of genuine automotive parts and accessories. Our core expertise is uh, in electrical parts. Um, ma major revenue generator for us is uh, wiring looms. We also do a lot of plastic components. Uh, and as you're about to learn, um, we've invested in wireless EV charging technology. So we have a unique skill set in product and component integration. Um, including development of custom installation solutions. So as alluded, uh, we have facilities all over the world. So from Lewin, North America, where we have sales, engineering and manufacturing, uh, headquarters down in Melbourne, um, sales office in New Zealand, and then uh, a large presence in South Africa um, and also Taiwan, Thailand and, and China. So the, the journey to date, so as I alluded, Lumen Freedom um, sits within the, the Lumen Group um, and the journey started back in 2016. So uh, at the, the CES event in Las Vegas, uh, our management team met with uh, Qualcomm Halo and uh, over some discussions eventually signed a, a license agreement um, to further develop and commercialise wireless charging uh, technology. So Qualcomm Halo with the core technology developers at the time. <clears throat> Our engineering team then in 2017 went on to go through a technology transfer process. So um, a bunch of our engineers sat down with the Qualcomm Halo engineers and they educated us on the development of the system and the core technology. Following that, we then invested in and developed our own 11 kilowatt system. By the end of 2017, we'd carried out a number of tests on the bench shop and, and achieved efficiencies in excess of 90%. So in 18, um, we, uh, we installed that system on our BMW i3 for further, further evaluation and testing. And we began the development of foreign object detection and uh, the refinement of our positioning technology. We also um, signed our first development and supply agreement in 2018. So it was a busy year for us. And um, that was with McLaren. I'm, I'm allowed to say that without permission for them to, to speak publicly. Um, so that took us through to an SOP in 2019. So we gained C certification on our system in 2019. Um, and during that year as also, Whitricity acquired the IP of Qualcomm Halo. Going through to 2020, so Lumen Freedom became the first person to achieve um, certification on our wireless charging system to UL2750. And we also extended our license agreement with Whitricity to um, include a greater portfolio, portfolio of IP. More recently, um, we've uh, begun the development of our, our second generation 11 kilowatt system. So a bit more about the technology. So our wireless charging technology uses resonant magnetic induction, which is efficient. So we, we can see we achieve power um, transfer efficiency in excess of 
which is uh, comparable to a, a tethered charging system. Um, as you as you could expect, the, the technology is convenient. So from parking your vehicle um, to charging and being able to lock and leave the vehicle is a seamless and effortless um, process. Um, contrary to, to a lot of beliefs, the, the system is um, tolerant to misalignment. So there is no requirement to be parked um, in exactly the, the right spot. Um, the, the system does allow for offsets, so it accommodates um, even the, you know, the most inaccurate and sloppy of parkers, if you, if you like. The system is, uh, is also inconspicuous. So the, um, you can see here on the vehicle, we've got the, the, the wall box on the left uh, and a cable running to the, the ground pad. Uh, the ground pad can be buried underneath asphalt or, or concrete um, and it's not affected by snow or ice um, that could, could cover the surface. <clears throat> and in time, um, and it's, it's been proven, um, semi-dynamic and dynamic wireless charging um, is on the roadmap, um, which further facilitates uh, snack charging, uh, which would in turn would allow OEMs to reduce the the size of the, the battery packs on the vehicle. Just a closer look at the, uh, the technology roadmap. So in terms of where we are today, um, our systems are developed um, at the moment for uh, the residential and, and office scenario. So charging at home or in the office. Uh, in time, um, we expect it to be integrated into public in infrastructure. And you can see there an image that we've had um, developed of a, a, a charging station of the future, so it could combine wireless charging, um, a semi-dynamic charging um, track, and then onto the, the, the roadway, full dynamic charging. Higher power, so in terms of higher power, um, at the moment we're, we're focused on 11 kilowatt. In time, we expect um, to be um, investigating uh, 22 kilowatts and upwards. So again, um, the, the, the technology that we work with has been proven to work at 22 and in excess of 22 kilowatts. Um, so it's fully feasible. Also vehicle, vehicle to grid, our, our licensor, Ytricity, have um, done a lot of work on vehicle to grid and again have proven that uh, the, the technology is compatible. So semi-dynamic charging, so you can see here we have a, a row of taxis parked at a rank. So this uh, this use case um, supports the taxis moving slowly from one spot to another as they're picking up passengers at uh, an airport or a railway station. And then we move on to dynamic charging, which is when the vehicle charges whilst on the move. And again, trials have been carried out and the technology has been proven with vehicles charging at 20 kilowatts and up to 120 kilometers an hour. So we're not quite there yet. Um, there's a lot of work to do, uh, but that's how we see the future. Thank you very much. And I'll now pass you on to Carrie. Thank you so much, Oliver. Uh, I'll try to share my content here. Um, there we go. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is uh, Karin Ebbinghaus. I'm the CEO of Elon Road. And as you know, we have the highest level of CO2 emissions in 66 million years. So you could think that we are on the road to disaster. But I'm quite convinced that we are able to make a U-turn if we act quick. And we can, we can turn this ship around and lower our CO2 emissions. And that is really the purpose of our company. So why do we want to do this? Um, we're a startup based in Sweden. And here in Sweden, road transportation stands for 30% of our total CO2 emissions. So if we are to be able to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, we need to really cut down. And the Swedish government, they have made a promise to, to decrease the CO2 levels of transportation by 70% until 2030. But there are some challenges. Uh, and we think that electrification is the solution and is the way to go. But it has its challenges as well. 
um, it doesn't really make sense to carry on on board all the energy you need to be able to transport it. It's expensive and it's heavy. And of course, there um, you can build out an infrastructure of charging poles around the country, and that could facilitate some. But if we really need to, to have this transition into electrification quick, uh, we think we have a better solution. So what do we do? Um, we have developed a high-tech uh, electrical road system that you can charge your vehicle both while you are uh, driving as uh, well as you being parked. So we're building this smart system for the future. Um, let me um, shortly uh, explain a bit about the technology. We have uh, taken forward this system that uh, consists of a connected smart rail that we build in 10 meter sections. And this makes it very easy to install, repair and maintain. You could either put the rails on top of the asphalt, as we have done here, where we do our demo project in Lund, or you could submerge it into the asphalt, which is probably more suitable if you want to drive on the highways uh, to make it uh, safe. And it's a conductive charging solution that we can transfer powers up to 300 kilowatts with a 90% efficiency. So how does it work? Uh, if the vehicle comes close to the uh, to the rail, it will send a encrypted radio signal uh, saying to the rail, here I am, I'm a, I'm a vehicle that is allowed to charge. And the rail will identify the vehicle and turn on the power submission in very short segments of only one meter at the time. And it's really this function that makes it possible to charge the vehicle both when it stands still and when it drives. And since we have the smartness in the road, we know exactly which vehicle that has consumed exact amount of power. So you could say that there's a billing solution built in the system already. And besides charging, uh, we have a lot of sensors built into the road, like temperature or shaking, moist, and even radar. So we could facilitate for either physical drivers like us or in the future in, in artificial intelligence to make better informed decisions about how to drive and when to drive. And we can see there's uh, a lot of different customer segments. Of course, uh, we are aiming for the highways uh, and there are some pilots here in Sweden, which I mean, Sweden is a quite progressive country uh, when it comes to electrical road system. Uh, but as Oliver mentioned, it could also be uh, suitable for park charging for taxis or uh, other commercial vehicles. And for buses, it's also very suitable because it would provide you with a flexible solution that you don't need to stand still and charge. And also we are working with ports and mines because our system can distribute that kind of high effects up to 300 of kilowatts, um, which it's quite flexible. So you can charge the small vehicles, but you can also um, charge the large vehicles. So basically you can use the same infrastructure, which makes it more cost efficient. Just uh, to say some customer cases that we actually are working on. So we do this uh, demo project in Lund, uh, which is financed by the Swedish Traffic Authority. We're building one kilometer. So half of, of uh, the line is uh, the submerged version and half of the line is, is the on top mounted version. And this testing will start uh, quite within short, just a few weeks uh, and will take place over the next 24 months. We are also doing tests with um, a port um, to see if we can electrify their big uh, straddle carriers, but also uh, no normal trucks, uh, because there we can say you can save time by not having to inst install the cables. Uh, it's high flexibility because you will uh, be able to have access to charging at all times of the day because they have three shifts. Uh, and also you will lower the cost because uh, you don't need so many batteries. So the total cost of ownership uh, will be lower in total. And there's a, it's a big market as we see. Uh, I mean, there are lots of road to be electrified uh, uh, along, um, in the world. And, and by 2040, we can see that 40% of all vehicles will be electric. And we think that we can contribute 
to facilitate and speed up this process. Because if we can uh, have access to charging, batteries can be smaller up to 50 and 80 percent. And then electrical vehicles will be cheaper and more people can afford to buy them. And that will also contribute to accelerate this transition. And as I said, our main main target is to reduce CO2 in transportation. And if we can contribute to, to uh, facilitate and uh, accelerate the transition and reduce battery sizes between 50 and 80 percent, which has been calculated by the university here in Lund, we think that we can have a major impact on continuing economical growth um, and having transportation, uh, but not having the negative climate effect as we do now. And the team. As I mentioned, we are a startup from Lund, and uh, is it even possible for a startup to take on this quite large challenge of driving a new charging infrastructure? And we're a mixed team. My background, I used to be an M&A lawyer before I came into better, in better Thoughts. And Dan, who's the founder and inventor, he used to be within television. So we, we are a diverse team in many, many aspects, but we are all united in the mission of driving uh, climate change in transportation. So if you want to help us save the world, we will do that one road at a time. Thank you. See if I can stop sh uh, sharing and leave the word over to Alexander, please. Oh, I will stop if I can find. Have I stopped sharing? Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So hello everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this uh, panel discussion. I'm Alexander Golisano, uh, Marketing and Strategy Director uh, for our Power Systems uh, Division and in the zone UK and Ireland specifically. Meaning we, we cover the smart infrastructure between 11 kV and 66 kV. I'm managing a team of offer managers and covering targeted segments like power and grid, onshore and offshore wind, ship to shore, rail, and of course, uh, EV charging infrastructure. Uh, we are proud to be a growing technology company providing energy and automation solutions for efficiency and sustainability for our customers around the world while continuing our strong commitment to innovation. Our revenues are well balanced in the world and we are serving our customers in four growing markets, buildings, data centers, industry and infrastructure. Today, almost 50% of our revenues come from digitalization, connected products, edge controls, analytics, software, services and artificial intelligence. Schneider Electric is a leader in the energy management landscape and, and we are playing an important role in the new smart grid from generation to distribution and now the grid edge layer. And we support our customers behind the meter uh, with solutions for smart homes, smart buildings and smart industries. Today the EV is posing a threat in the demand side and as Schneider, we obviously need to play a role in, in this transformation for our customer. We see a strong uh, EV uptake happening now in the UK. And according to National Grid, 10 million cars will be electric by 2030. And this is about 25% of the total cars on the road in the UK. And why do we see such an increase? I think the main point is the general public's awareness or wake up call after the Paris Climate Agreement and now in the UK with the net zero 2050 plan developed by the government. And when we start uh, and then we see now multiple drivers forcing an adoption on the technology side, the total cost of owning a car, an electric car is decreasing. And an example is the curve of the battery cost. The number of models developed is decreasing and the new cars are as well attractive. So all the new models developed are increasing in the market. And on the other side, let's say the 
pull from the government and local councils is rising. Corporate companies are transforming their entire fleet. And as an example, Schneider is now part of the EV100 initiative, committing to the electrification of our corporate fleet. And by 2030, we plan to replace 14,000 vehicles in over 50 countries with electric cars. Or recently, Uber pledges to shift to 100% electric vehicle by 2030. And finally, we see the, the development around us of charging infrastructure. And the business for, for, for the business opportun opportunity is huge for, for a company like Schneider Electric. Today, the opportunity is massive for us and, and Schneider can support uh, you with a very deep offer in the market. We can guide the customer in the consulting phase. Do we need to reinforce the network? Where to strategically place the charger? Or can we explore a micro grid installation? Moreover, with a local partner, we can propose a funding model for you for energy as a service. We have a strong technical capabilities in the UK and our solution architect will design the most optimized solution for your need. Last point for the capital expenditure side, we can deliver a power infrastructure made in Leeds and Scarborough. And by the way, we have nine production sites in the UK. And we are offering a full range of AC chargers and we can propose as well DC chargers with our partners. For an optimal um, operation expenditure, we are offering our cyber secure ecostructure architecture. Equipment with sensors, edge control, and then all the digital remote services on top. We have defined a tailor approach to each vertical at home, at work, at destination, at fleet, at transit. And in addition, we are working with many partners in this booming ecosystem to go faster, especially on the software side. And it's what we are calling innovation at edge in Schneider. As you can see, we, we can be a one-stop shop for you. So please contact me to discuss how we can help you. And I'm giving the ball to Alan. Thanks, Alexandra. Um, so, so the first one, so nice quick introduction for me. Hopefully everyone can see the slides. Um, so uh, I'm Alan McLeave, UK General Manager for New Motion. Uh, I've been with the company for uh, over two years now. Uh, worked in the fleet world for over 20 years in leasing. Um, and before New Motion, I was active in the sort of energy sector, working on various kind of uh, electric vehicle type projects. Uh, in terms of new motion, we've been around for over 10 years in terms of um, smart charging. Our headquarters are in Amsterdam. We've got five uh, offices across Europe, one of which being London, uh, although I'm not in it at the moment and don't know when I'll be back in it, but hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, we've got certainly over 300 employees. This, this changes every day and 35 nationalities across our business. We cover pretty much all of Western Europe uh, with a slight omission of Portugal, but um, hopefully we'll be adding them shortly. Uh, and you can see our main offices there in sort of Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, France, and uh, UK. Um, we're very much about the whole kind of smart charging piece. So this is at home, uh, in the workplace, uh, and obviously as part of Shell on the go. And then we have our um, our roaming network across Europe now. We are fast approaching sort of 200,000 um, charge points across all of those countries you can see there. Um, so that's us. And the only plug I'm going to do other than that is um, I've got a sector uh, EV um, tomorrow between 11 and 12, just talking about sort of the future of EV infrastructure charging. But otherwise, that is me. Thank you, Alan. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. And we can see you now, Alan. So that's a, that's a positive. Yes, two two um, systems working at the same time to create this. 
I, I noticed that you, you have your uh, identical twin on one side, but he's afraid to show his face. Yeah, yeah it's actually, I've just realised my laptop has just suddenly decided to work. So um, let's get rid of one. One image of me is more than enough, I can assure you of that. Hmm. I may have caused the wrong Alan to go. <laughs> no, I'm still here. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Absolutely superb insights, really, into the uh, charging and infrastructure side. <clears throat> Very fascinated with uh, wireless or, or induction, inductive charging. Um, to me, we're on, we've got some tremendous targets to achieve when it comes to sort of governments and, and the Paris and everything else. Practically, can we do it? Do you think? Can we can we put in the infrastructure that people need in order for them to fulfil the targets that we're having to achieve, rightly so, um, but also to get the customer uptake? Now that's a bit sort of uh, over the top, but if we could start with you, Karen, in relation to. Um, what 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 you're doing in in Sweden, um, that must take a tremendous pressure off the the sort of curbside or or sort of fast charging and everything else structure. Yes, of course. I mean, uh, traditionally, if you could talk about tradition and we come to electrical roads because it doesn't really exist yet, but the common view has been that it only is supposed to support really heavy traffic or heavy trucks. Uh, to be able to electrify those um, and there are some technologies um, for that purpose only uh, uh, but our view is that why why settle with only heavy trucks if you can have an infrastructure that can reach both heavy light medium and personal cars i think that would be sort of more bang for the bucks if you're taking tax money to invest in infrastructure and my view is that I don't think we should be afraid of having to invest in something that will work for the next 10, 15 years. And if we see that hydrogen or uh, fuel cells could work in the future, which it doesn't at the moment, but we need to do in investments in infrastructure quite soon uh, to be able to accelerate the, uh, and lower the carbon emissions from transportation. And if that's not working in 20 years, then we can make a new decision because the climate doesn't really have the time to wait. Uh, so I think that we need to to invest in technologies and infrastructure today, um, but not for like take, thinking, oh, this is a railway and should work for the next hundred years. Uh, but there, the politicians may have to be a bit brave uh, and um, not only thinking of what will get you re-elected uh, for the next session. So what's your thoughts on that, Oliver, having? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's the, the multi-billion dollar question, isn't it, really? Um, for sure, we're, we're all going in the right direction. Um, as I've alluded, uh, Lingham Freedom at the moment, we're focused on um, home and, and workplace charging. Um, but in the future, for sure, um, we, we envisage this, our systems being deployed in public infrastructure, and then um, semi the rollout of semi-dynamic and dynamic wireless charging. Um, there are obviously still a lot of uh, a lot of questions to answer, um, and I think to some degree um, the te technology has been a, a victim of its of its own success. Um, with dynamic charging having already been uh, tested and proven to some degree on on public trials. Um, a lot of OEMs have come to us and said we want dynamic charging. And we've had to explain that, that we're not quite there yet, that there's a, a number of hoops that we've got to go through in order to, to achieve dynamic um, en masse. Um, there's the you know, commercial model as well that needs, uh, that needs to be looked at in more detail. Um, so yeah, for, for us, certainly we're going in the right direction. Um, it's just a, a, a lot of work still to be done. So I 
think you're on mute there. Yeah, Peter. you're on mute, Peter. Yeah. Sorry about that. So I'll start that again. Um, the question really for Alexandra and Alan, really more for what I will call the, the, the current uh, sort of charging systems that we have. We, we as, a, as a country sort of target local authorities or regions on the number of charging points that they have available. Is that right? Or should, should a, a region be penalised if they have less but more what I would personally term practical fast charging systems around. You know, shouldn't it be an, an equal field? Should it should it not sort of address the needs of the driver rather than what we think the driver might need? Yeah, I think to sort of come on that, Peter, the, um, if we're going to encourage people to uptake electric vehicles, then they have to have charging infrastructures within where they live because let's not forget 40 percent of the uk population don't have off-street parking so they're going to need reliable public charging infrastructures or on-street charging infrastructures to, to support them otherwise we're going to have 40 percent that will struggle to convert unless things radically change so um you're probably right at the moment it's who shouts loudest or who proactively gets funding or whatever it might be that's kind of driving it um, I guess there's probably some correlation of that in terms of where the vehicles are sold, which, which makes some sense. But yeah, if, if we're going to, you know, make sure that everyone has an opportunity to adopt this, this, this needs um, infrastructure, you know, where, wherever there are conurbations, simply um, to persuade those people that it is a viable option for them. That's, that's the challenge we're probably facing at the moment in this kind of early stage. And, and to, to add a comment, we need to help um, people to to discover electric cars because you are not using your electric cars like you were using your car in the past. You are not waiting the end of, of the, the tank to just refill it. It will be completely a different way of charging the cars. It will be at home, at destination, and not necessarily at transit. And we have to guide the customer because it's so important for the grid to make sure we will guide them in the right direction otherwise we will just create peak every time or anywhere in in the in the network so it's it's very important to install some chargers everywhere there is not one technology it could be many technologies in place and we need a huge supply chain to to make it happen so it's not only the standalone chargers it will be on the road it will be everywhere so I, I will say to, re to reply to your first question, there is a, a supply chain in place for EV and I think we can reach the 10 million cars by 2030 and even by 2040, the, the huge ambition of the government. Whereas in some other initiatives for net zero, like offshore wind, it's quite difficult in terms of supply chain. So we are in a good place in EV, it's a booming ecosystem, many players. And, and now it, it starts to make sense economically and do we need a car in future? Is it only the fleet car from, from your company? Uh, is it public transport? So it's a mix of multiple technology and people will have to think differently the way they use car and the way they charge their car. It's not the same uh, standard way we used to do in the past, I think. Karin, you, you raised your yes. hand. So, Thank yeah. you. Yes. Because we think either if it's a conductive charging or dynamic charging, I think, as you said also, we need to rethink and redesign how we think about transportation in the future. I don't know if you the same age as me, um, but I remember when I was young growing up, you know, you had your telephone and it was stuck to a cord to the, to the uh, wall and you have to stay there and talk on the phone. And when I explain that to my children and they go, what? How is that possible? Didn't you have like access to freedom and just walk around and talk wherever you wanted? And I think that when they explain to their children, you know, when mom grew up, we had to go and refill our car or we have to stand still and charge it. And their children would go like, what? Didn't you have access to like charging everywhere an unlimited range? And I think that's possible. And, and when we think about the future and, and do the investments today, we shouldn't really be stuck in, in tradition and, and how it's supposed to be. And we're so used to be, to, to refill or recharge, but there are other solutions. And, and when it comes to distributing the, for the grid, I don't know about the dynamic solution, but our, our conductive solution 
it has so much smartness. So, so if it's a high peak power, we cannot allow access to charging or just allow to the one who needs the most or do pay the most. Uh, but it, it's actually a, a good way to balance and, and you will have a more smooth uh, sort of demand on the grid because you will be charging when you have access to a lot of renewables. And as Oliver were in, I mean, you could also use if you have your vehicles and you will be able to charge them while you're driving during the day, it could actually be a quite good energy storage for, for a capacity that's available in the grid during daytime. So just For me, the, the uptake for people to move towards electric vehicles, which, which we all should, they're beautiful to drive when you drive one. They're smooth. It's a totally different driving experience in a positive way. But the bottom line is, unless you have the, for me, the infrastructure at home or the ability on the remote times that you distance travel to not have to wait hours to actually find uh, a point or even longer time to actually charge it. As an example of that, we, we as a company had a, a tremendous uh, Audi e-tron on test. It was the most awesome car to drive. It was beautiful. The technology was right. But within the office complex, there are no charging points. I don't have one at home. And um, so we, we chose the only, the only uh, charger that was available on the high street an hour and a half later, it had increased the Audi's range by 12 miles. So, so that was a reality of the car. Nothing wrong with the car. It's just that it, it the car and the charger wasn't in, in sync for me. So how do we educate people to, one, look at the way they travel, or two, to have that sense of, of security that when they do have to go on the longer trip, they're not going to have to pause for a long time. And, and especially with the, the lower range vehicles, which are, are, are popular because of the price to get the full sort of a, a attraction to EVs that we want. Any thoughts on that? I think it's a big question, Peter, because you're right what you're saying, and, and kind of Alexander touched on this earlier, that the range of vehicles is, is going to explode over the next few years. So you're going to get a lot more choice of city vehicles, you know, longer distance vehicles or whatever it might be. So I think today perhaps choice is, is more limited depending on your budget. So, um, you know, if somebody like myself who does a lot of business miles uh, a year, I drive an i3, so it's not really ideally designed for that with a range of kind of 100, 100 miles roughly. Um, so I adapt what I do to make that work for me. So I leave earlier um, and I plan stops through the day in between my meetings. So it can be done, but that, you know, that does take a lot of planning. So not everybody, that's not going to be a mass market adoption thing. So you're, you're definitely right about that. So, you know, even today with, um, you know, a fraction of the infrastructure that's going to be available in, in three years time, 10 years time, et cetera, and, and all these different fantastic um, inventions that, you know, Karen's talked about, Oliver's talked about, they're all going to increase that that ability to do some charging at home, do some charging in the workplace and then do some charging on the go. And, and that's how it's, it's going to need to work because, yeah, it, it's, it's hard to kind of set your diary in advance and go, OK, on that day, um, you know, I come back at, I don't know, six o'clock at night. I need to go back out at eight o'clock. I need to charge at peak time. It's either not possible or it's going to cost me a fortune. So because you've got to bear in mind the grid, it's, it's not generation that's an issue it's just physically our grids can't handle everybody being plugged in at peak time so you know all of the solutions you've heard here are all part of the you know the solution no individual one is the solution i think that's the key point that i would like to make and that's why we welcome you know karen and oliver's development i don't see them as competing products i think they're necessities to enable everybody to be able to, to take a, a plug-in vehicle and, and go drive it for whatever purposes they have. So I think that's the message I would put out there. there there's no silver bullet here. It, it's a mixture of solutions that, that are going to be needed. And listening to what you've all said, uh, 
putting the solutions together, it solves a lot of the problem. Uh, and a lot of problem within the mindset of people. On that front, from a, a sales of a vehicle perspective, should, um, do you believe, the infrastructural side or charging side should be part of the analysis that a dealer makes in order to assist the person in choosing the right vehicle for them? Sorry, I'm going to end up jumping in again. Forgive me. Um, we, we work with a lot of dealers and, and that's certainly our view of life is, is dealers have to take that into account. If somebody goes into a dealer tomorrow who lives on the top floor of, of a group of apartments, is electric vehicle the right thing? It might be. doesn't mean it's not. Just because they happen to be there, there may be charging facilities in a shared car park or something like that. But there, there needs to be a real consideration around that because a lot of people at the moment in the UK, because benefit in kind on battery electric vehicles is currently zero percent. A lot of fleet drivers saying, yep, that's the vehicle for me. No benefit in kind. Off I go. It takes a little bit more consideration than that in terms of like we just talked about the range for what they want to do. Can they have charging at home if they can't have it at home? Does it exist at the workplace? If it doesn't exist at the workplace, can they realistically charge on a rapid charger somewhere near to home? you got to take those things into account because today is an electric vehicle right for every single person the answer at the moment is probably not so you know let's not kid ourselves that every single person tomorrow can drive an electric vehicle a there's not enough supply b i don't think there's the right price points and range flexibilities to to potentially suit every single person but you're right what you said peter in terms of some of the solutions people here are talking about if you had all of those available today that would bring a lot more people into that that marketplace so the infrastructure challenge is as much a important part of the puzzle as the vehicles themselves so when uh openly to everybody when we we achieve uh more movement towards this this overall plan surely that's going to impact on the size of the battery we would need in the vehicle which would then sort of uh, reduce the amount of, of, of lithium, etc., that we need to produce. So wouldn't that make it considerably more sustainable for everybody? Of course, yes. I mean, the discussion about, you know, or suspicions you've had about EVs is that the, are, are the total uh, climate impact better or worse if you have a combustion engine or a normal car and i mean up to now with large batteries it, it's questionable even there are research showing that the sort of both the total cost of ownership and the climate impact is better so if we can decrease battery sizes it, it is really that that will have the huge co2 impact not only going from fossil fuels over to batteries but also reducing batteries so that should be the ambition. Even if the uh, batteries will be cheaper or more efficient, there will still be a lack of uh, natural resources and, and conflict minerals. So, of course, that should be our overall ambition to have to have lesser batteries. But there will be enough vehicles for the battery manufacturers to to have a good business as well. Yeah, and, and to add to your comment, Karin, um, I think there is some now companies looking to recycle the batteries. There is some company like Tesla exploring new uh, component inside the battery. But then there is another question. Do we need the same amount of cars in the future when we will have uh, a different world, let's say in terms of e-mobility? So maybe less, maybe it will be a car for your residential area and everybody will use the same car. And, and with a smart system, you will just lock your car for one hour, two hours. Because today you use your car to go to your work, you leave your car for eight hours, you take your car back. Some people are driving every day, they use a car generally. So I think the, the, the total amount of car will reduce as well. So it's a complete system. We, we have to look at an, an holistic view, not only uh, your, your traditional way of driving your car. It will be, uh, we will have to rethink the total system. And in the next five, 10 years, it will happen. There will be some smart, uh, smart zones, smart office, and it will be part of the full ecosystem. I think you touched on it, Peter. I think you've got the bumblebee challenge with electric vehicles, which is how do you make an efficient vehicle when it's weighing two, two and a half tons? And, and the answer is you probably don't. So 
things like solid state batteries, if, if that ever arise, where theoretically you can get the same amount of power from half the weight, makes a lot more sense. But obviously we've got other ideas here from Karen and Oliver that, that would mean you wouldn't necessarily, necessarily have to have such a big battery because you're picking it up as you go rather than necessarily having to put it all in the battery in advance before you go. So these are all interesting advancements that would increase that efficiency. And then of course, by default, if you make the weight less, you get more range out of what you have got. So I think efficiency is a key thing here. I think also um, autonomous vehicles and autonomous electric people movers are going to have a massive influence in the future as well. So obviously uh, with them being autonomous, wireless charging, uh, it's a perfect fit for them, but also um, the appetite amongst uh, amongst younger people uh, and their desire to own uh, a car. Um, there been lots of reports suggesting that, that maybe in the future, the younger younger aren't going to want to own vehicles, they're going to want to click their fingers, use an app and, and have a vehicle turn up outside their, outside their door, pick them up, take them to work and whatnot. So it'll be interesting as well to see how, how that influences, uh, influences the market. We've had a number of questions in, but we're not going to have time for all of them. Um, one um, recent uh, question from Duncan. Uh, how does the panel feel about the likelihood of electric utilities having no choice but to mandate smart residential charging? That's kind of already in play because OLED will only pay a grant out against smart chargers. Um, the government's actually talking about using you know, energy meters in the home as actually being the controlling factor for charging, TV, battery storage, whatever. So at the moment, smart has an opportunity to be able to build a peak off peak, you know, all those kind of functions. Um, the problem is in the UK is who controls that? Um, will it be utility companies? Because the problem in the utility company is they've got customers across the whole of the UK. So you're talking about managing small grids here, and it seems more likely someone like a DNO distribution network operator would probably manage that rather than the utility company, I think. But um, that's kind of that's being worked on at the moment. But yeah, technically the, the technology is already there. Smart charging exists, it's being promoted by OLED today. Um, it could help, it already can and does help the grid. It's just about how the UK chooses to regulate in terms of what does that mean? You know, when, when, how are we going to control that time of use? Tariffs are coming in now, which again is, is aimed at trying to push things like charging or general energy use away from the peak hours. So we're going to see more of that as well as a carrot to the customer to say, Hey, Mr. Customer, if you put your washing machine on at midnight, I'm not sure how feasible that is, but if you could do that, then then guess what? It's going to be a lot cheaper. So there are both, you know, it's not just stick factors. You, you need some carrot factors here as well. Thank you all. I've, I've got to cut. We could have carried on for a long time, especially with the amount of extra questions in. Uh, but to, to plug back for Alan again, do everyone viewing um, look and register to go to the Knowledge Hub tomorrow because all of these additional questions will, will obviously be answered. Um, so a thank you to Karen, Alexandri, Oliver and Alan. Uh, really appreciated your time. I know with the, with the views and whatever the audience has. So thank you very much. And unfortunately, we have got to close. But uh, thank you. All the best. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.